Thank you. And this is a perfect follow up. I, I know it was planned that way, so, but a perfect follow to what Catherine was saying, because a lot of the work that Trust for America's Health does is around promoting this integration of what happens in the community and in the clinical setting and thinking about uh, prevention and, and um, what role that can play in improving health outcomes. Um, so you've heard all of the evidence about why lifestyle is important. Um, that's hardly new, and it's hardly new just to the cancer field. Um, how we figure out how to implement that is the bigger challenge. And this is not a decision, so almost answering Catherine's question about who and where and how, this requires a partnership. It requires a partnership between the clinical setting and the community. So the best advice from, you know, so we can solve that problem of only 30% having a conversation with their physician about uh, prevention and physical activity and nutrition, but then they go into a community where they don't have walkable sidewalks, walkable streets, where it's unsafe, um, where, um, you know, where there are, aren't healthy food options. Well, the best prescription, the best counseling, the best work in a clinical setting will make no difference unless we're also solving what's happening in the community. And ultimately, it's about a cultural change and making sure that the values that we have as a society and as a community encourage that physical activity and that improved nutrition. You know, there are lots of very specific policy efforts that went into reducing tobacco use, but it was actually the sum total of all of those efforts that created a culture shift that then made for a very different societal attitude about smoking and tobacco use. So we have to focus on creating those partnerships identifying what has to happen in the clinic, what happens has to happen in the community in order to really achieve these kinds of lifestyle changes. And we have to be able to frame the value of those partnerships in terms of what everything that is driving the healthcare system today reflects, which is improved outcomes and lower costs. So to try to address some of that, TIFA does an annual report on obesity called Ephes and Fat, um, our 2012 version. We partnered with uh, the National Heart Forum in the UK to do some projections around what would happen if we stayed on the current trajectory of obesity rates, what would happen in terms of its impact both on healthcare costs and on various conditions associated with obesity. And so here you can see if we stay on a national level on um, the, the current uh, the current trajectory, we would see by 2030 400,000 excess cases of cancer. So it's a very, it's you know not as dramatic as with diabetes, not as dramatic as with coronary heart disease, but certainly very important. And when you layer in what Catherine was talking about in terms of the higher risk for comorbidities, it becomes uh, for cancer survivors, it becomes even more important. Then we also looked, and uh, we had these data on a state-by-state -state basis, and I just picked Wisconsin, because actually I had that slide available, and therefore didn't have to recreate it. Um, but we have this data available on our website for every state. That not only looks at the potential reduction, if we, the, 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 the difference that we, we modeled here was the current trajectory, which is the last two columns, the number of cases and the costs, um, uh, but also um, I'm sorry, what, what this shows, I, I apologize, what, what this shows is first the number of cases in 2010 and the second line is obesity-related cancers. And then if we reduced average BMI by 5%, how many cases could we present, prevent, how much, how much in healthcare costs could we prevent uh, in 2020 and in 2030? And I pick, we picked 5% for a reason. That's the performance measure for the current community transformation grants that are focusing on physical activity and nutrition. Um, and so if those programs achieved their goals and if they were truly implemented on a national scale, what would we be able to save? And you can see just in Wisconsin alone, by 2020, 75, cumulatively $75 million in healthcare costs. By 2030, it would be $187 million in healthcare costs. I think to almost any policymaker, that's a number that would, those are numbers that would, I think, cause them to pay some attention. The challenge here is, as has already, I think, been mentioned, is thinking about lifestyle changes. So that's tobacco, say, tobacco, physical activity, nutrition, and understanding how they fit into a much broader population level. The first thing that I think is really important is that we need to recognize you know, that different people will care about these issues for different reasons. 
So a lot of clinicians are really uncomfortable talking about doing primary prevention. That's not their thing. But if we can convince them, and the data I think do, that if you want to prevent a recurrence of cancer, um, that you also need to address these lifestyle issues. So we don't need to care whether why someone is motivated to start talking about lifestyle, if it's primary or secondary prevention. We just need them to be doing it because that will then contribute to this larger movement toward changing lifestyle and improving health outcomes. Um, these, as we saw from the data around comorbidities, these are interventions that are almost universal in the sense that physical activity is the closest thing that we have to the fountain of youth. Um, and whether it's, you know, you could look across all of the silos. So think of all the silos at CDC. There are probably hundreds. And whether it's mental health and depression or preventing violence or preventing STDs, you know, if you're physically active, you're in sports or something, you're not doing other things. Um, <laughs> that's for kids at least. Um, the, um, whether it's heart disease, you know, all of the diseases at the chronic disease center, it is the same intervention ultimately. It's about physical activity, nutrition, and smoking cessation. And yet we silo those programs. So we have diabetes prevention programs that promote physical activity and nutrition. We have cancer programs that promotes uh, physical activity and nutrition. And, you know, just go across every one of those silos. That doesn't make sense anymore in terms of efficient use of resources. And it also, particularly in a primary prevention standpoint, doesn't make sense in terms of reaching people. Different people have different senses of their risk. So if you're a cancer survivor, of course you're going to worry about a recurrence of cancer. And you probably will worry about that more than cardiovascular disease, although the data seem to suggest that I have a higher risk of dying of cardiovascular disease than a recurrence of my cancer. So that would be, OK, so that's interesting to know. Psychologically, it's cancer that's on my mind. And so we have to reach people with where they are. Um, and so even if we consider it to be primary prevention for cancer, if, people can, is more, if a person is more worried about cardiovascular disease or diabetes, that's OK. Let's get them however we can. And we have all of these co-benefits. We haven't structured our interventions. We haven't structured our conversations in the clinical setting or in the community to recognize that broad range of potential implications. And we also have to recognize that while individual and group interventions are important, the systems and policies and community level changes are incredibly important as well. We have to create the environment where the healthy choice is the easy choice, where the healthy choice becomes the norm. And particularly when we're talking about kids, we have to create environments where those choices really do become, the healthy choice really becomes the default, because they are not necessarily going to be in a position to be empowered to make choices on their own. So three opportunities. I, I frame them as opportunities I, in the forum. I don't know the forum well enough to know how it translates into work of the forum. Um, the prevention public health, so some of this is around the Affordable Care Act. The Prevention and Public Health Fund, which supports community transformation grants as well as a wealth of other prevention programs, is a vital piece to what needs to be supported to make primary prevention work. The community transformation grants are a model for thinking about how you bring together clinical prevention and community level prevention. And that's a model that should be embraced. It should be perceived as not just an anti-obesity program, which it really is. Um, it should also be perceived as an anti-cancer program. And the, the, way, the weight of the cancer community needs to be brought behind supporting those transformation grants, understanding them, and tailoring them to reach those populations. We also need to think about the financial incentives. You know, we heard in the previous panel about changes in the health incentive system. If we're not, we are moving far, we, you know, I would predict that, you know, five, 10 years from now, there will be very few people working on a fee-for-service basis. Don't faint some of you who rely on it. But the more we are holding, we are reimbursing people around uh, health outcomes rather than on volume, the more there is an incentive then to think about both primary and secondary population, the uh, secondary, primary and secondary prevention. And the more there is an opportunity to think about what happens in the community and having the health system contribute to what happens in the community because it helps them meet their goals. That's 
you know, seeing the affordably accountable care organizations, for example, investing in community prevention and actually becoming accountable care communities, as some are doing. It's about thinking about the new opportunities under Medicaid and how they can, and that's still in formation, how this is going to work, but Medicaid will now re reimburse for non-licensed professionals or not, uh, who, like community health workers who work in the community doing community prevention. How should that work for cancer prevention? And the new requirements for hospital systems to reinvest in their communities, less around uncompensated care and more about what happens in the community. Um, that can also be an incentive and a resource to be thinking about cancer prevention. And finally, how do we de-silo these programs? Um, how does that happen across the CDC, across the public health agencies, so we really have a better understanding of focusing on interventions that are cross-cutting rather than on thinking about them disease by disease. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Barry Kramer, who's director of the Division of Cancer Prevention at the National Cancer Institute. He'll speak to us about evidence-based screening guidelines and practices.